Hello, everyone, and welcome to After COVID-19, What Comes Next, a class in, Bi in Biblical Prophecy. In this lesson, we're concluding um, our study on the Book of Revelation, the last um, section, seven, se scene number seven, which talks about the New Jerusalem and, it, and all that happens in, in it as well. So... Um, we have our little review bit, and um, we'll just go through a little slowly. Um, and our keys and our motifs, we see that we're now in the seventh motif, which is tabernacle, and both both are tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles and the tabernacle um but this is a special part because it says in in Revelation 21, the tabernacle of God with humans, there will be no more separation between God and, and human beings, which is something that we deeply have to look forward to. So, um, all right, scene number seven, heaven. So before we begin, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this awesome promise that we have in the book of revelation with all the negativity in the book and all the things that have happened we we sometimes focus all of our attention on the negative parts without remembering that every single prophecy ends with the second coming every single prophecy focuses on not the negative but on the fact that you're going to come and, and redeem humankind and we will be living in heaven a, part of a life free from any heartache and any pain and any suffering that we experience here on earth. So help us to focus on this and remember the, the wonderful promise of Revelation that those who read and who hold the truth in this book will be able to, to join Jesus in heaven someday very soon. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So... <laughs> We have the streets of gold and the city of New Jerusalem. So one of the things that Jesus always referenced in his, in his, in his imagery was this idea of the wedding, of the marriage supper and the lamb. We have that in Revelation. You remember in Revelation 9, a few chapters ago, says, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her, granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down on his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brother who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So in, in Jesus' writings, we see this constant reference to weddings. We see um, when Jesus says, you know, um, in John 3, 16, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that was the imagery, the wording of a dowry, a marriage covenant that God made with, with his righteous, with his people that have, have committed to him. Prepare a place. When, 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 the, when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that's exactly what the groom would do when they were getting married. They would, they would propose marriage. They would pay for the, the dowry. And then they would go back to their father's house and build a, a, a a honeymoon suite <laughs> attached to the father's house. And this is actually a custom that is still taking place in the Middle East. 
um, they will um, build the family house and then uh, the second floor will belong to the first son, the third floor will belong to the to the second son, and so on and so on. And as many sons as are in their family, that's how tall the building is. So it's very interesting that um, that that's they're still living that way. That's still a custom in the Middle East, but how wonderful Jesus saying, I'm going to go prepare a place for you was using the term of, I love you and I'm, I'm going to be married to you. And that's what I'm going to do is I'm going back to my home to prepare a place for you to come to. The bride is then brought. And that's where we see the, the parable of the 10 virgins. So the father would determine the time and the groom would come with the bridal party to gather the bride. So then the next part would be the bride would be would go through a cleansing uh, ceremony. And that is what we see in Revelation 9, 19, 8. And then we have the wedding ceremony. You have the consummation, which um, the Bible doesn't speak to directly. It doesn't, it skips that, that part of the illustration. And it goes into the wedding feast, the marriage feast. So... Uh, we see what Jesus was showing us with this is how how love how much love and how much intimacy he wants to have with us because um, apart from the sexual aspects of this um, you you have to realize that uh, a husband and wife that's the most intimate relationship that exists on on in this side of heaven. And that's the relationship that, that Jesus is comparing our relationship with him to. He wants to have the most close, intimate relationship with us. And this imagery is, is purposeful to show us his love for us and, and his relationship with us. So we have, uh, we're going to go back a little bit to show the righteous aspects of of the scenes and then we're going to go into the final scene so you have the rider on the white horse in 19 11 and 21 it says then i saw heaven open and behold a white horse the one sitting on it was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread them the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God of the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. With a loud voice, he called to the birds, fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So here we see Jesus coming in and rescuing us. And he has a different imagery because it's focused on, um, this is focused on the perspective of the evil camp on the side of the wicked people. But um, we have our knight in shiny armor coming down to rescue us. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, um, who in its presence had done this, the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. These two men, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So we have some, some um, identifiers for the second coming. One of the things that we need to understand 
is that the second coming is not going to be expected. Um, Matthew 36 through, through 41 uh, says, But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it will be the coming of the Son of Man. The two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. So this will be a complete surprise unless you already know that you <laughs> you know that it's coming. You don't know when it's coming. But the only way not to be surprised is to be prepared in and out of season. So the second coming will also be unmissable. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the, the coming of the Son of Man. And do not marvel at these, for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear the voice of Hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So in the second coming, the next part is that the righteous will go to heaven. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. So the righteous will be able to go to heaven. But we don't know, do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even, <clears throat> even so, through Jesus, God will bring the, with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice, with the cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the righteous are taken to heaven, but the unrighteous die. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh, as we read skip that verse so what happens for the thousand years the we talked yesterday about what happens with the unrighteous and what happens with the righteous and now we're going to focus on what happens in the thousand years with the righteous so it says then i saw an angel come down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain and he sees the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he may not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After this, he must be released for a little while. So this Satan is in chains, and the unrighteous are dead, and he can't tempt anyone. And then I saw thrones, and sitting on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So that's the righteous 
uh, we will be in heaven as judges over the um, over the judgments of the unrighteous and the righteous and and understanding um, why some people went to heaven and why some people didn't go to heaven because that's going to be a big question in our hearts and minds but that's what the righteous will be doing for the first uh, bit of time the first thousand years and that's the promise from first corinthians 6 2 that we do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world so because we have a we have a truth in the in the that's a universal truth in the bible and and hopefully in in this life even though justice isn't always fair um that concept that everyone is innocent until proven guilty is something that um we hold very important in our society um and all of us fate we're are going to face judgment for our actions and we will face a fair trial we will be judged by a jury of our peers and we're not punished until we're proven guilty which is something that i think um is a wonderful is a wonderful um promise to us is that um is that we don't have to be um suffering until we're proven guilty um we don't we're not uh, in limbo in a place between heaven and hell waiting for our trial we are um going to be waiting uh we're not going to be waiting we're going to have the experience of being able to if we're righteous being able to um judge and and see if the lord was right in his judgment or or if we have been righteous we'll be able to see that the lord has been right with judging us righteous so uh, we are judged by a trial a uh, trial by peers jury of our peers um so uh, like i wrote here uh you you think immediately when you read this you're like okay so what that's talking about is is we're looking down and we're judging everyone um who's bad but what we're really doing is confirming god's judgment and and understanding that god was right to condemn that person even though they went to church and they were a quote-unquote good christian um because they were uh pretending to be a good christian but their heart was far away from god they didn't get to heaven and then we're going to be able to see that god was fair in his judgment so the last the scene is is satan defeated the white throne and when the thousand years are ended satan will be released from his prison he will come out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth gog and magog the enemies of god to gather them for battle their number is like the sand of the sea so the unrighteous dead are resurrected and they march up over the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints and they beloved and the beloved city but fire comes down from heaven and consumes them and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they were tormented uh day and night forever and ever so then you have the great white throne where god judges the the unrighteous and 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 executes their punishment then i saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them and i saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open then another book which was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in these in the books according to what they had done and the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged every one of them according to what they had done then death and hades were thrown into the lake of fire this is the second death the lake of fire and if anyone was name was not written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire so this is the sentencing where sin is finally 
being punished completely. Um, for um, <laughs> so now we get to scene seven. So these are all the wonderful things that are happening in the righteous aspect of it. So now what happens in here? Intro is the recreated heaven and earth. So we start in Revelation 21, 1 through 8. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the city was no more. And I saw um, and I saw the, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Again, the same concept of, of bride and, 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 and uh, love and, and, and jewel. So the city of the Jer New Jerusalem is, is representing, you remember the 144,000, which represented the, the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. So the, uh, the city is kind of the symbol that takes on the term of bride representing us as, as the righteous and our relationship with God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be that with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. I think that's the the most wonderful promise that is in the book of Revelation. So it, it remember, this doesn't happen until after sin and, and, and uh, everyone who has been punished in the lake of fire is, uh, is, it takes place. Until then, there is still suffering. There is still crying. There is still mourning because even in the thousand years, uh, there's going to be sadness in the thousand years. We're going to be in heaven, but there's going to be a time for us to to be sad for those who aren't in the book of life, who didn't make a choice to be saved. So there is still suffering, and there's even suffering into the point of of. Uh, the moment right before the second the second coming when all the unrighteous are thrown into the lake of fire but what we don't understand we, we got confused because we mixed the theology of the immortal soul which is a greek theology which actually is a babylonian theology we mixed the idea the theology of of an eternal soul with um with christianity and we see things that say forever and ever, and we're like, okay, that makes sense. That means that they're going to be um, cooking forever and ever. And, and that, that just it seems cruel. And it, we don't understand that what we do when we say that people are going to be burning forever and ever is that we make God a sadistic God. Because um, if you think about it, say, okay, if a person could live forever, how long would the worst prisoner ever, um, how long would they have to stay in prison before they would eventually get out? Um, because no matter what the crime is, eventually they would serve their they would serve their punishment if they live forever. Eventually they would have spent enough time to have repaid their their crime. And we're saying that God will never forgive those people because for all eternity he's going to be punishing them and there's never going to be a point where he stops punishing them and no matter what crime you committed if you're being tortured for that many years there has to be a moment where it's not fair anymore and god is is fair so what we don't realize is when it talks about forever and ever it's actually referring to the consequences Forever and ever, there's going to be no more uh, life for them. They're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. There's no eternal 
uh, suffering for them, because death itself will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, neither will there be pain, neither will there be suffering. All of those things are going to end. And that's why it says it at that point, because at this point, when the heaven, when the New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, the unrighteous are not existing anymore. There's no more unrighteous. Uh, sin is not existing anymore. There's no more sin. There's no more suffering. All of those things are gone. And that is when we can actually experience true uh, freedom from sin. You don't have to cry anymore because there's no reason to cry. And I know, you know, I, I know that you can say, well, I, I cry when I'm happy too. <laughs> but, uh, you'll be happy. You won't have to cry. <laughs> you won't be so, you won't be so happy that you'll be over, um, overwhelmed with your emotions and you'll start to cry. You will just be super happy and you won't need to cry anymore. And there's no more death and no more suffering. So that's a very important promise because it shows us, not only does it show us that we're going to be in a perfect state of, of uh of existence with no more suffering or pain but it also shows us that all the sin and suffering has been wiped off the earth and now no longer exists so there's only good from here forward and this is the moment when we experience true heaven not before it's right here after after the the new jerusalem comes down that we're actually experiencing the full um joy of heaven and he who sat who was seated on the throne said behold i'm making all things new also he said write this down for these words are trustworthy and true and he said to me it is done i am the alpha and omega the beginning and the end to the thirsty i will give from him the spring of water of life without payment the one who conquers will have his heritage and i will be his god and he will be my son but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immor immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and fire, which is the second death. Um, so before we go to the New Jerusalem, I just want to remind, want to talk a little bit about this. Um, wait, am I, did I skip ahead? What did I do? Oh, whoops. I kept going. <laughs> um, so we don't realize how much sin has affected the world. Um, uh, it is one, one of the most interesting studies that you can do is over the book of, uh, over studying about the flood and about the effect that God had on the world with the flood. What happened to the, to the world that we live in now? Um, what was the world like before the flood? And we don't realize that in order to save humanity, God had to destroy the world in a very specific way. There was very, there were some very interesting things that God had in place before the flood that he had to destroy in order to save humanity. And, um, and the earth has been scarred with sin from the very beginning that sin started. And even heavens, even the stars and the and the planets have all been have all been scarred by sin. So God is is in his first act after the destruction of evil is making everything brand new and taking away all signs of sin. There will not be any evidence that sin ever existed except for the scars in Jesus' hands be the only sign that sin ever existed in our memories of course so all right let's keep rolling so it says the new jerusalem so um then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues uh um then came excuse me saying come i will now show you the bride the wife of the lamb and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. So this is a, 
a big city, 12-sided city, and the gates, 12 angels, and one and on the gates, the name of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it's a marriage of the Old and New Testament together. Very significant. And, on, and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. So it's a, it's a giant cube. Its length and its height and its width are equal. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Well, it's good to know. We have the same measurements in heaven and on earth. Um, then the wall, was, the wall was built of jasper. Oh, man. I need a, I think I have that in the next slide, which the city was pure gold. Um, well, the city was pure gold, like clear glass. If you ever seen a, you know, we think of gold as being this shiny yellowish brick. I know you can't really describe the color gold, but it's, it's a shiny brick. But the truth is that when you have pure gold, absent of any, um, any uh, impurities, it's actually see-through. So um, believe it or not, when you have this pure gold in the in the city, it it is it is almost translucent. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx. Oops, excuse me, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates was made of a single pearl, giant uh, clam, I suppose. And the street of the city was made was pure gold, like translucent glass, transparent glass. So. Um, we cannot picture this, how beautiful this is, but it is just amazing to imagine this. It's the most precious materials that this world has to offer. Any of these things would be, would be millions of dollars in our, in our society today. And the whole city is made like this and it's not made like we do today to, to, uh, uplift ourselves and say, oh, look, I have a gold Rolex. Look how nice it is. It really um, is, is purely to glorify God. It's, not, it's, uh, it's the most precious and beautiful um, building materials that, that exist. And regard, you know, even though we see them now as being, um, uh, uh, was it uh, valuable, um, their, the biggest focus is their beauty. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need for, of sun or moon to get to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. No more sun, no more moon, no more temple. Um, because who needs a temple to connect with God when we have God right there? We don't need an intermediary. We can connect straight to God. Who needs the sun and moon when God himself provides our light? So um, by its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. So the gates are not going to shut. It's, it's really... The gates don't serve the same way they serve here in, in our world to protect and to 
prohibit people from coming in and out. They serve more as a, as like a, a archway just to hold the wall together to allow you to enter. Um, it's not is not going to be uh, any war, any kind of any kind of uh, restrictions. We're going to be able to access the New Jerusalem anytime, anywhere. They will they will bring into the glory uh, and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Nothing unclean, nothing detestable, because that stuff doesn't exist anymore. So then we have the river of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life being bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God. Oh, can't you just imagine? You ever see water that looks more beautiful than a gym? It, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see those kind of places. I can just imagine how beautiful the, the crystal flowing river is. It flows through the middle of the, of the street of the city, and on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. That's interesting, too. It's a tree of life. We always think of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being an apple tree. And we always picture the tree of, the, of, the, of, the, of life being uh, some kind of un, 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 unknowable fruit. And, you know, I, I know that some of the people I know would say that the tree of life have, had mangoes on it. But the truth is that it's going to have 12 different kinds of fruit and each month is going to have a different kind. So, uh, so much for that theory. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the, of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his faith face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more and they will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. So the final events, so right before anything happens, the people of God are sealed and uh, those who follow the beast receive its mark and then the seven last plagues will will follow to protect God's people. Babylon will be destroyed, and Jesus will come and receive his people. Everyone else will be killed, and then the thousand years will take place. You have the righteous um, in confirming God's judgment. Um, the unrighteous are dead, and then afterwards, Satan is defeated forever. The unrighteous are defeated forever. Sin is destroyed, and there's nothing of sin. Everything is brand new without any, any sign of sin ever again. And God dwells with man forever. What a wonderful... You know, we, ha, uh, we focus too much on the city. Um, you know, the fact is that if you could promise me no more sin and being with God for, I, I could live in a garbage can. I really wouldn't care because what is, I, I really don't, and, and just to be honest, I, I'm not a jewel person. I'm not a shiny person. I don't like um, like gold or silver, all those things. Uh, that doesn't appeal to me. What appeals to me is that promise that, that I'm going to be able to walk and talk with God and and there's going to be no more sin, no more suffering, no more scars. Just a perfect, pure um, utopia with God. And it won't be boring. And um, we're going to be able to explore the galaxy. You just you think about everything that's fun to do. And you just take away the, the sin out of it. And that there's going to be something there that, is going to be better than we can even imagine. You think about all the fun things that we can do here on Earth. Um, imagine, imagine the same things, but without sin and without any uh, negative consequences, and 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 no end to our our wonderful experiences. So, 
that's how the book of Revelation ends. Happily ever after the end. The end. So we have here not the, have here the <laughs> epilogue. So excuse me, I'm gonna excuse me. Yeah, we have just a little bit left. Um, and this is John's last moments. He says to them, he said to, the, to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of this prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am your fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the word, words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Brothers and sisters, the truth is... We're not talking about something 500 years from now. We're talking about something that's going to happen soon. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So that is what we have to look forward to. And that is how the book of Revelation ends. Happily ever after. So, all right. Thank you all for joining me. It's been a wonderful experience. I'm going to close with prayer, and then I'm going to stop the recording. So let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful promise and this wonderful story that, that we have to look forward to, that you are going to take us to a place where there'll be no more suffering. And yet, well, the things that we can do in heaven are uncountable. Too many people have it described heaven as sitting on clouds playing musical instruments when the truth is that they will be much, much, much more enjoyable than that. We will be able to go to the most beautiful places in the galaxy. We will be able to um, study and learn. We will be able to work and do all kinds of things. And, and Lord, there will be so much joy for us because there will never be anything to make our hearts sad, to, to hurt us, to cause us pain to cause us to tears. And Lord, I'm just looking forward to that day where there will be nothing that separates us from you again. Help us, Lord, to be ready because it's coming soon. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. God bless. And we'll see you for the next class that will be coming shortly.